So let's just start, though, with the term people pleaser so that you and I are on the same page. People pleaser refers to a person who just has a strong desire to please other people, even if pleasing other people comes at their own expense. And if you struggle with people pleasing, I certainly used to. I mean, those of us that were parent pleasers, we grew up to be people pleasers. And so if you struggle with this and you often feel like your own wants or needs don't matter, or you tend to bend yourself into knots around other people, or you find yourself having a really hard time just being yourself or saying what you really want to say, you're not alone. And you're going to get all kinds of awesome tools today. And the other thing that's interesting about the research that we did to prepare for this episode is that people pleaser, that's not a medical term. That is not some sort of diagnosis that psychologists use. That is simply a way that we describe casually this coping mechanism that we all engage in in order to keep the peace, in order to fit in, in order to feel love. There are four takeaways that I want to give you really quickly, and then we're going to go to Janet's question. Number one. Every human being is a people pleaser. Everybody. Unless you're some narcissistic jerk or you've got some other neurological condition that prevents you from truly bonding with other people, in order to get through life, you have to make other people happy. You have to, for example, put your boss's needs ahead of yours if you expect to remain employed. It is what it is. Your spouse and your kids, they come first at time. Your parents, when you were little, you wanted to please them. And there are times where you need other people to be happy with you. Like when you're at the DMV, that clerk that you hope does you that quick favor, you better make sure that they're happy with you. Or the person who's throwing the big party in Cabo over spring break, definitely you're a people pleaser around that person. I don't blame you. You want the invite. That's the big takeaway. You're not the only one that struggles with this. Second takeaway, you're never going to get rid of people pleasing entirely. I wouldn't want you to. You can't because some level of people pleasing is necessary in life because relationships are a give and take. And what we're going to talk about today is the balance. How do you balance other people's needs and your own? Third takeaway, people pleasing is only a problem if you do it by default. So if you're the kind of person that is so focused on other people, you don't even know who you are anymore. You've been neglecting your own needs or silencing your own voice, or you constantly feel like a doormat that everybody walks on. People pleasing is definitely a problem for you. And this is something that I want you to get ahead of because I want more for you. You're going to get more out of your life when you're more self-aware about when you start putting other people first and abandoning yourself. And so today I'm going to probably make you pretty shocked at how prevalent this is for you so that you can start making different decisions moving forward. And that leads me to the fourth takeaway. You can take your power back. My mission today is to help you understand the topic, gain more self-awareness so that you can interrupt this pattern and you can create a different pattern, which is making conscious decisions in your day-to-day -day life that truly empower you. Because you can learn how to consciously choose when you are going to put other people first and when you're not, and you're going to put yourself first. So let's start with a question. This one comes from a listener named Janet. Hey, Mel. So the way I was raised was that what defines a good woman is what she can do for others, for her children, for her husband, whatever. And you always came second, whether it was you were the last to take a shower before you went out, you were the last to eat at a at a family event, whatever it was. So my biggest struggle now is doing, creating self-love for myself without feeling guilty, without feeling like I'm not being humble enough or without feeling like I'm less of a mother or less of a wife because I'm taking care of myself. Um, I know it's the other way. I know that I have to take care of me so I can take care of others, but I just have a hard time doing it without feeling that guilt. To me, it literally feels like a child learning to walk. Um, I don't know how to do it without feeling guilt. I want to remove that guilt from inside of me. Janet, I got some bad news. You can't remove the guilt. I'm going to say that again. When you first start putting yourself first, you will not remove the guilt. And so I just want to be honest about that. 
but let me give you the two takeaways, okay, that are really important because this really isn't about guilt. This is about you defining for yourself what it means to be a good wife and a good mother and a good person in your eyes. And so I'm going to give you two major wake-up calls that I had around this topic, and then I'm going to tell you this crazy story. So the first wake-up call that I got is this notion that the people who love you, they will be annoyed with you when you put yourself first. It is true. They are not going to like it. They like you being the person that you are right now. It is convenient for them that you put them first. It is wonderful, the dynamic that's in place, but it's no longer good for you. So just expect that the people who you love will be annoyed or disappointed or upset when you start putting yourself first, but they're still going to love you. It's not an either or thing. And I'll explain more about that. And second, this is a huge wake up call. What if the guilt doesn't go away? What if guilt is actually a good thing? What if guilt is super healthy to feel right now? In fact, that's what I believe. I believe that the guilt is good. I believe that the guilt is healthy. And I believe that you can reframe it. See, guilt shows that you care. That's why you feel that way. If you were a narcissistic douchebag, you wouldn't feel guilty at all for putting yourself first. I want to frame guilt in a different way for you, okay? Let's frame it from a bad sign. Ooh, I'm doing something bad. I'm putting myself first into a good one. Stop seeing guilt as a bad thing because you're not doing anything wrong when you put yourself first. Start seeing guilt as a good thing. Guilt is a sign that you're breaking free of this people-pleasing habit. You feel guilty because putting yourself first is just a new feeling. That's it. You know, I had this insight a few years ago that I think might help you. Two things can be true in life at the same time. You can put yourself first and disappoint people, and they can still love you even though they're disappointed. And here's another example of how two things can be true at the same time. You can feel guilty and you can still put yourself first. Pretty cool. It's not an either or. And that's why I say that this topic about people pleasing is about balancing your needs with the fact that in order to have great relationships, you do have to compromise sometimes. And the balance comes in because in order for you to have the life that you want, you are going to disappoint people that you love sometimes. I, I experience this all the time. I'm 54 years old. I still want to make my parents happy. Why? Because I love them. And because that's what I've always done. And so when I get into one of those moments where it is a balancing act, it's not easy. And I'm going to tell you a story about this. My dad is an enormous billiards fan. And when he was in either college or medical school, he used to hustle for money at a pool hall. Like he is a great pool player. And I grew up in a town called Muskegon, Michigan which is the world headquarters of a company called Brunswick, which used to make all of the old pool tables. And so my dad became just a huge fan of collecting antique pool and billiard artifacts. In fact, my parents' house is full of them. Old pool balls, pool cues, the little counting-like things that hang on the ceiling, artwork, a pool, to, like just all chairs from billiards. My dad loves this stuff. So when Chris and I got married, he gave us a refurbished Brunswick pool table that dated back to the 1800s. And it had been in a Vikings lodge in Muskegon, Michigan. And he ended up buying it at an auction, had it refurbished. And it was like the greatest thing ever. But here's the problem. When Chris and I got married, we lived in an apartment. Like, whose apartment has room for a pool table? And so this beautiful pool table sat in my parents' basement in North Muskegon, Michigan, for over a decade. And so all this time goes by. Chris and I have now moved to Boston. We've bought our first house. It is a teeny 
tiny antique farmhouse. There was not a single room that was big enough to clear a pool table. I don't know if you understand how a pool table works. I didn't realize that you need four and a half feet clearance around the pool table in order to play pool. This was like not something I was aware of. So we couldn't even fit it in our house when we first bought a house. It couldn't fit in the basement because we had a dirt basement. You're not going to put a pool table down there. So more years go by. And then Chris and I finally have enough money to refinance the house and put on a small addition. We were going to put on a garage with a room above the garage. That's what we were going to do. And to my dad, he was like, great. That means the pool table finally has a home. Now, given that I did not know that you needed a certain amount of space to put the pool table in, I had envisioned that this room above the garage would be the kid's playroom, right? And I thought, oh, okay, well, you know, it's a two-car garage, so clearly we could put a pool table in there and it'd be the kid's playroom. So get this, my dad is so excited that I fly back to Michigan and he and I take a road trip in a U-Haul where we drive across country from Michigan all the way to Boston together and we bring back all kinds of stuff from my parents basement and we split a bunch of plants from their yard and the pool table was in the back and my dad hires somebody to meet us there and we assemble the pool table and when they finally finished assembling this pool table it sat in the middle of this playroom like a felted aircraft carrier our playroom as it turns out was only big enough to put a pool table in it no room for the couch no room for the kids play table just a big ass antique pool table that was a sign of my father's love and devotion to his daughter did i want the pool table there well for the first year or two it was great but then it literally just collected dust. And as the kids got older, it became the table that they played Legos on. And then it became the table that I folded laundry on. And then my business started to grow. And I started thinking, boy, it'd be awfully nice to have an office, a place to uh, work. But I didn't dare disassemble that pool table. Why? Uh, the thought of disappointing my father? Heartbreaking. Now, keep in mind, He's only at my house once or twice a year. So we're talking maybe four or five days out of 365 days is the man going to see the pool table. But nevertheless, like a dutiful daughter, because I love him and I did not know what I know now. I thought that in order to have my dad love me, that meant that I had to just keep this pool table like a uh, mausoleum. Is that the word? that uh, represented, uh, you know, my father and my duty and my loyalty. And as my company began to grow, we put plywood on top of the pool table and we worked on that. And then finally I thought, what the hell am I doing? I am a grown ass woman. I need to disassemble the pool table. My dad will understand. I will assure him that the second that I am successful enough to add on to this house, again or do something else the first thing that i will do is build a room where we can put a pool table i wish i had more money i wish i had a bigger house i wish i had one of those great rooms that people have that you could launch a cannon through but that is not my life and it is not what my needs are and in order to put my needs first and my business first and for my kids to have a place to to be able to be too i can't have this felted aircraft carrier in the middle of this room I need to take the room back. And so I'll never forget this day. I picked up the phone to call my dad. And when I heard his voice, I immediately started to chicken out. Hey, Mel, what's up? Hey, dad. And of course, I talk about nothing. And my stomach ache is churning and I'm starting to feel stress diarrhea coming on. And finally, I'm like, okay, God, Mel, five, four, three, two, one. You're not eight years old anymore. You just feel like you are. And I'm like, dad, I got to talk to you about something. He's like, yeah, what's up? Okay, so the pool table you gave us, 
yeah, yeah. How, how's it going? You guys love using it. Like, I'm so happy your brother, they just moved into their house in Chicago. And so the, the table that I gave them, it's in their basement. We played last weekend. My heart is sinking in my chest. This is not going according to plan. So I take a deep breath. I said, Dad, yeah, about the pool table. My business is growing so fast. I really need a place for the people that work for me to come and work. Oh, great. They're going to love playing on the pool table, too. Like, you know, the cool offices all have pool tables and ping pong. Dad, um, I don't have enough room um, in the room that it's in. Oh, well, it could go in the living room. Like if you got dad, I, I like it just can't because the living room's not big enough. So what are you saying, though? Well, what I'm saying is I was going to hire the guy that you hired to like level it and put the slate in to come back and lovingly like take it apart. And I was going to store it in a really loving way until I have a place for it. Silence. You want to know how I felt in that moment? I felt like the world's worst daughter. I felt like an ungrateful piece of shit. Because through the silence, I could feel my dad's heart sink. And it was a really hard thing to do. And that's why I say this is a balance. Like it's so easy to say on a TikTok video, just say no. When it's somebody that you love and you know that you're going to disappoint them, that's not easy. And you can still do it. And what's interesting about that moment is it, it didn't feel like this victory. It didn't feel like, yeah, there was this residue there because I knew that he was disappointed. And I was disappointed too. I wish I had a bigger house. I wish I could accommodate this beautiful gift. I wish that I had a basement that it could go in. I wish I lived closer to them. And so all of that emotion came crashing in in that moment. And that's why I'm gonna keep on saying, learning how to balance those moments when you know that your decision that is truly best for you and what you need is going to disappoint someone. Remember that two things can be true. You can do what's right for you and you can have somebody be disappointed in you. And you can know that deep down, they still love you. I mean, people that you love disappoint you all the time, all the time, and you still love them. And it's a real art to learn how to be in those moments with grace and advocate for yourself and still hold space for somebody to be upset with you or disappointed in you or sad about it. That's what that moment was. It was just both of us feeling disappointed that it wasn't different. And, you know, do they tease me when they come over? Of course they did. For years they did. This was pretty recently, by the way, everybody. So I'm just remembering back to the fact that when I released the five second rule book, it was 2017 and I self-published that and we did all of the internal layouts. Do you know what I used that pool table for? It was our creative desk where I laid out the entire design of the five second rule book. So I'm talking less than five years ago, everybody. I had this conversation with my father. And whenever they would come visit, they would walk in and they'd look in the direction of where my office was and nice pool table. Or every time I would say, yeah, I'd love grandma's uh, table from the kitchen. And then my mom would, you know, <laughs> say something snarky like, oh, is it going to end up in the basement with the pool table? You sure you want it? And you know what? They're allowed to say that. They're allowed to be disappointed. They're allowed to call me out on that. And I have to create space for them to have their feelings. And I also believe that that's one of the things we don't talk about a lot in relationships and people pleasing. Like you think when you're people pleasing, it's all one way. It's not. It's a give and a take. 
If you want other people to make room for the very real emotions that you feel and the reason why you need to put yourself first in certain circumstances, then you got to show up and hold up your end of the bargain and make room for their feelings of disappointment and confusion and sadness. And just know that when somebody is given the space to process it or to make a joke or say something snarky, because let's face it, do you know what's underneath that snarky comment? Oh, is it going to end up in the basement like the pool table? It's hurt. It's sadness that's not processed in a healthy way. And so just keep in mind that, yes, when you start putting yourself first and when you start making decisions, you will disappoint other people. Give them space to feel that and know that they will still love you. They do, even if they don't express it in a constructive way. And also know that you can feel guilty. I sure as hell felt guilty. And you want to know what? I still feel guilty, even though it's not my fault. And I feel so guilty that, you know what? Now that we're here in Southern Vermont and I've built this dream house of mine, I made damn fucking sure that in the barn, you better believe there's not only space for that pool table. I built a barn so that we could put the pool table in there. So, Dad, I know you're listening. You get your ass up here because I'm going to beat you in a game of pool when you do come, okay? And I can't wait. Um, and, yeah, I still feel a little guilty. Why? Guilt is good. It means I care. And it means I am expanding my capacity to live in that balance, to do things that really work for me and know that that is not going to work for some other people. And that's okay. That's what it's all about other people's reactions from a slightly different angle. Hi, Mel. Um, my name's Anna. I just saw your stories and thought I'd send over um, a question that I've been having. Um, my question is is more about, well, I, I consider myself a very independent person and am definitely very disciplined in what I do, um, but that leads me to live a life that is very different from most of the people I surround myself with, I guess. Um, so my question is more of how to really hone in on that discipline and, and keep living the life that you know you should be living, even when others don't understand it or um, just don't get why you're, <laughs> why you're doing it. Thanks. Anna, I love this question because you are making a mistake that every single one of us makes when we start to live a life that is truly aligned with what we want to be doing. Everybody that you're surrounded with right now has been on the road with you up until this point, but they have no idea what your day-to-day -day life is like moving forward because they're not living the same kind of life. And here's what I want you to understand. When this happens, and you start to make very deliberate changes, whether it's in your health, or maybe you've launched a business, or you are just tired of kind of a gossipy social climbing circle of friends, and now you're seeking deeper meaning in your life. You don't have to ditch those people. They can continue to be in your life, and they will be part of the rest of your life. But they're never going to understand what you're going through because they don't live the day-to-day -day life that you're living. And a major mistake that I see people making is as we're making major changes, we turn to our existing friends and our family for counsel and they have absolutely no idea what we're going through. So for example, there are very few people on the planet who actually understand what I do for a living. I can count them on one hand. When it comes to speaking on corporate stages, hosting a podcast, creating content for people like Starbucks and LinkedIn and Audible, to being an entrepreneur, to having the social media following, to having uh, a marriage and a family, like very few people that understand the pressure I'm under, the impact that I'm making, the goals, the hopes, the dreams, the frustrations. My husband doesn't understand it. He's not in that world. My kids don't understand it. My Friends don't understand it. If I want somebody to truly understand what my life looks like, I got to pick up the phone and call Jay Shetty or Jenna Kutcher or Trent Shelton, like somebody who is doing what I'm doing. And it goes for everything. Like I'm in the middle of menopause 
I'm dealing, I talked on the last uh, a couple episodes ago about this bread basket that I'm feeling on my waist and hormone stuff. I'm not going to go to a 28-year-old uh, fitness freak in my family and ask them for advice about my stomach. They don't understand what I'm going through. And so I'm, I'm making this point because when it comes to people pleasing and when it comes to putting yourself first, the way that you continue to create discipline is twofold. You have to get super intentional about seeking out more people in your life, either through mastermind groups or following people on social media or attending like online classes or going to different events. You've got to find people who are up to what you're up to because they'll understand. They'll support you. And you have to stop seeking validation from the people that are already around you because that's not why you're doing this thing. And here's one more thing I want to tell you. Why do you care what they think? You already said you're independent. You already said you're putting yourself first. Why on earth would you seek validation or advice from somebody whose lives you wouldn't, who you wouldn't trade lives with? Just stop asking people who are miserable or unqualified to validate your happiness, your life, your choices. You got to validate yourself by making decisions that work for you. Stop looking for validation from other people, particularly other people who don't even understand themselves or what you're doing. Because if they can't understand themselves, if they don't understand what you're even trying to do, there's no way in hell they're ever going to understand or endorse what you're doing. Instead, start looking to people who have made the changes that you want to make, who have the values that you want to make. Not only do they understand what it takes to make this change, but they also have the confidence in the track record and the experience to cheer you on. Well, we've covered a lot of ground, and I think you're starting to realize, wow, this people-pleasing thing isn't really about saying no. It's about self-awareness. It's about my ability to catch those moments where those uncomfortable feelings rise up and to tolerate them. It's about my ability to know that there are going to be times in my life where I'm going to be making decisions that people that I deeply love are going to be disappointed by, and I can make space for both. There are going to be times in my life where I'm pursuing a change in my lifestyle that nobody around me understands, nobody else is pursuing, and I got to stop this default of seeking validation and advice from, from the people who don't understand what I'm doing. And when you learn how to do that and start making decisions that really empower you in the long run, your life is going to change. It's going to be more meaningful. It's going to be richer, deeper. You're going to feel more agency and control in your life. And I know what you're thinking right now. I know here's what you're thinking. Mel, dear God, do I want this. But if I'm the kind of person that has never, ever, ever put myself first, how the heck do I even know when to do it? And let me tell you something. First, you have to go back to the beginning and become self-aware. And you have to get deliberate about defining the person you are becoming. Let's hear this final question from a listener to this podcast named Nella. Hi, Mel. I am a big fan from Ireland. Um, my name is Nella. I'm a singer-songwriter. And something that I definitely struggle with is with masking and, you know, being afraid to show up as my true authentic self um, to all people at all times. Yeah, just any advice would be amazing on how to just get better at doing that and have the confidence to just be my authentic true self um, all the time. <laughs> that would be great. Um, thank you. Nella, thank you first and foremost for your honesty. Um but I'm going to say something a little provocative. You kept saying the words true, authentic self, authentic self, authentic self. And I want you to stop and ask yourself, do you even know who you are? Do you know what it means when you say, I am my true, authentic self? And the reason why I'm asking you this question is because I don't think most people do. I think we want to be our... We want to be our authentic selves, of course. But what does that even mean? You know, listening to your question, it reminds me when I was writing The High Five Habit, there was a woman who wrote to me from Ireland and I ended up getting on the phone and then on a Zoom call and I spent a lot of time talking to her and she is in the book. 
And I want to bring this up because I want to make a point about the pressure that we feel to conform. So in this example of the woman from Ireland, she was writing about the fact that she wanted to get a divorce. That is her true authentic self. Yet she had been delaying doing this for seven years because of the pressure of the Catholic Church, because of the disappointment of her mother, because of what the priest might think, because of what the whole freaking country of Ireland might think. And so I'm highlighting this because for some of us, people pleasing is even deeper than sort of this discomfort. It's the social norm. Like you wouldn't be caught dead in some cultures or in some religions or in some households veering from the norm. The pressure is so intense, it's just the air that you breathe. And for many people, that is the case. And so if that's you, you might not even know what the authentic you is because you have been told for so long by your country, by your religion, by your family, by the community you live in, by whatever, who you're supposed to be. And I'm going to give you a really important exercise. I want you to just imagine that you are a screenwriter, that you are about to write a movie about the real you. Write a character description and describe a day in the life of the real you. Remove the country you live in, remove the religion you grew up with or you didn't, Remove the stories that you've been telling yourself or the pressure you feel or the disappointment or what other people think you should or shouldn't do and write the story, a day in the life of who you are at your core, when you would wake up, where you would live, where you would go, what kind of work you do, what kind of friends that you have, what are your habits, what do you love doing, who are you laughing with? This is such an important exercise because, again, remember, I told you that people-pleasing, it's a balance. And it begins with you truly knowing yourself. And if you don't really know who you are because you've always been told who to be and you've spent your life feeling like you do nothing but conforming, this is a really important step for you to take. Because people-pleasing at its core is you believing the person that you are deep inside that it's not good enough. You're not good enough. And based on what we've talked about, you can start to change that. But you really have to go through the steps of getting curious about who you are for real. And if the idea of you having a conversation like I did with my dad, or you telling somebody that you're not coming over for dinner because you're tired, and that's the truth or saying that, nope, you can't borrow my pickup truck again. I don't lend it out anymore. If that makes you really uncomfortable, here's a tool that you can use to start to experiment with that moment of discomfort. And the tool is called switch. And this comes from research. You don't have to say yes. You're going to go from saying, sure, I'll let you borrow my car or sure, we'll come to Thanksgiving or sure, I'll do that or yes, 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 yes. Instead of saying no, switch it to a pause. I'll think about it. Let me check my calendar. I'll get back to you on that. When you switch your yes to a pause and you buy yourself some time, you're going to feel a little less pressure. For example, when you say, let me get back to you. 20 minutes later, you can email back and say, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm booked. Or send no over text if it's too hard to say it in person. Or say no over the phone if you don't want to say it to their face. But switching from feeling the pressure to say yes to putting yourself in a pause, that's what I want you to practice. Because if you can say, I'll get back to you, let me think about it. You got time to settle those uncomfortable feelings. Because remember, it's not about the other person. It's about you not being able to tolerate that discomfort that rises up. And then you immediately make the discomfort going away by going, oh, okay, fine, I'll do it. No. <sighs> Switch into pause. Switch into pause because in that pause, you're going to find some peace. In that pause is where you're going to find that balance. And I'm going to give you one more quick little example about how this works. So last week, I was in Las Vegas and we were on day 15 of a 16-day business trip. 
and we landed late and we did a tech check because I was delivering a speech in the morning and we were about to head up to the hotel. It was eight o'clock at night and I turned to my friends and I'm like, we should probably get something to eat because we haven't eaten since lunch. I know it's late and we're going to get up early and then I'm going to have to race and do the speech and then we're going to race and we're not going to have any food in our stomach. So we went straight to the steakhouse that was in the casino. We walk in there wearing sweats off an airplane. It is 8.30 at night. This place has a freaking DJ in the bar. People are thumping and bumping and glitters and sparkles everywhere. They seat us right away in the bar at a high top. The three of us order immediately because we are going to shovel down that food. I got the filet mignon and some mashed potatoes and we got mocktails. And right above our head was this speaker that was like boom, 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 boom. Like we were, I mean, it was like zero to a thousand inside this place. I was not ready for this. I just wanted to get some protein in my stomach and get to bed because I had a speech to give and I was exhausted. So we're eating and we're kind of bopping and talking. And right when the steak comes, I hand her my credit card signaling, bring me the check right away. I'm part of the clean play club. Like I am done. I have finished in probably 11 seconds flat. Uh, Melinda, who was at the table with us, she is done too. I look over at Amy. She is eating in slow motion. She is enjoying every bite. I think she is engaged in a mindfulness meditation with this steak and salad at this point. And as I assess what is left on her plate, I think, this is going to fucking take her 20 minutes to eat. It is 930 at night. I am exhausted. This is the moment I'm talking about everybody. This is the balance. Because the wave of discomfort comes up in my body. I want to leave. I want to go to bed. And I don't want to be a douche. I mean, here, one of my closest friends is sitting here enjoying a salad. We've been on the road together. I'm like a ride or die kind of person. What kind of a jerk leaves their female friend alone at a high top in a bar with a salad that has 85% to go in terms of completion just because they're tired. I do. (laughs) Uh, That's a joke. It's a balancing act. I said to myself, well, what's really going to serve me? And what's really going to serve me because my number one job is to kill it in that speech tomorrow is to ask Amy if it would be okay for me to go upstairs and just go to bed. And I felt that discomfort because the old Mel would have been like, I would have just sat there because it would be rude to leave somebody. And oftentimes we don't even ask. We don't even ask. And Amy's sitting right over there. So Amy, I want you to get on the mic because I I rode the balancing act. I used the tools and I turned to her because a lot of this is also about the context And it's about how you say it. It's not what you're saying. It's how you say it. And so you don't feel like, I'm leaving. Out of here, bitches. That's not what I said. I just said, Aim, would it be okay if I head upstairs and go to sleep? I'm exhausted. And Amy, what was your experience at this moment as I'm clean plating it and you've got probably 20 minutes left? Yeah. I mean, you're a fast eater. (laughs) So that was house number one. And I felt like... When you asked me and you said, you you mind if I go upstairs? I felt like, thank God, because I would not want her to sit and watch me and my llama eating habits, super slow and just savoring every bite. I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want that to be the case. I want you to do you. And I want me to enjoy my salad and my steak. So when I, when you noticed that my plate was clean and so was Melinda's. Yeah. And you still had 20 minutes to go. What were you feeling? Well, I. I'm often in this situation. I felt like I know what's going to happen next. They're going to want to leave. And I'm, and I'm happy to do that. I felt, I felt really happy for you to get what you needed and I needed to get what I needed. I wanted you to hear that. And this is why you often don't even ask. And Amy was relieved that I asked because you know what? She doesn't want to sit there and feel pressure. She wanted to enjoy her salad, and that's exactly what she did. Melinda and I went upstairs. She sat there for another 25 minutes bopping and weaving alone, having the best salad of her life without her annoying friends sitting there staring at her like she was some kind of a zoo animal. So we all won. Bottom line, people pleasing, it's not about the other people, it's about you. So notice when it comes up. Notice that discomfort. Find the strength to say no. 
I'm not going to sit here with this discomfort and do something that doesn't serve me. When you have the ability to recognize this and you have the ability to say, no, I'm not going to just fall into line. No means that you're in charge of your life. No strengthens your self-discipline. No keeps your goals and your happiness front and center. It can make you stronger so that you change patterns and habits that don't serve you. Because when you don't say no, you're saying yes to something else. It is powerful. When you say no, I am not going to do that. I'm going to ride this uncomfortable wave and I'm going to do what works for me. And I'm going to know at the end that you can be disappointed and you're still going to love me, but I'm going to love myself a little bit more because every time you say yes to you, you are proving to yourself that you deserve to be happy. You deserve to have support. You deserve to go to bed in Vegas because it's late and you deserve to have that room back because you need it. And you deserve to do things that really work for you. So starting today, start saying no. Start tolerating the discomfort. Switch your yes to a pause. And put yourself back in charge. Your happiness, your life, it starts with you. Always. Always, always, always. And I know you can do it. And I want you to do it. And you don't have to prove anything to me. You got to prove it to yourself. So I promised you an exercise because step one is you have to get honest with yourself and claim what you want. That's step one. And so I'm going to tell you that. And I want you to think about your dream. I want you to think about what's calling you. I want you to think about the thing that would be so magical if you could make it happen, but you've been arguing against yourself. And I want you to allow yourself to claim it. And as you sit there and think about the dream in your own life, let's go back to Los Angeles. Let's go back to that stage. And let's check in with Barbara because I'm going to ask her to start getting honest. And what I want you to pay attention to is I want you to pay attention to how much she starts to joke and make excuses and dismiss how serious I am about dreams. Maybe you needed to move to South Florida to actually feel and understand in your soul who you are and what you want. It's a scary thing to admit what you want. Yeah. Because it's true. It might not happen. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's not, I've come so close to it happening so many times and it hurts so much. It's all so scary. There's part of me that's like, no, don't do that. But why is it scary? Because I don't want to go into debt and I, I just, I want to like be at least somewhere. So I thought, well, I have this, you know. But here's what I want you to understand. You have not gotten honest with yourself about what you actually want. You're putting all the energy into, but I don't want to go into debt, but I don't want to do this, but I don't want to do that. So then you do that anyway. Yes. <laughs> That's the first step, honesty. And it's very sobering when you get honest. Because for many of us, I mean, look at me. I spent 11 years making excuses for why I couldn't start a podcast. And all those excuses and the dancing around and the, oh, brushing it off and the, I'm not really that serious about it. It's painful. Your dream isn't painful. Like she's talking about how scared she is that the dream's not going to turn out. What's actually painful is how much energy you're putting into avoiding what you want and what you deserve. And the three big ways that we extinguish that flame inside of us and we put distance between ourselves and the dreams that are meant for us is number one, we, we literally downplay them. Anytime you make a joke about your dream, anytime you're like, oh, I'm not that serious about it, you're putting distance between you and your dream. You're taking a bucket of water and you're trying to extinguish the flame inside you. Anytime you make excuses, I don't have the money, I can't do it, I don't have the time, blah, 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 blah. Same thing. Cold bucket of water on that flame. Stop doing it. And the third thing, when she really gets honest, 
When you have that moment of reckoning with yourself and you can claim what you want, it's terrifying. It really is because you allow yourself to feel desire. You allow yourself for just a second to feel possibility. Just imagine how incredible it would be to do a stadium tour and sing your own songs. And when you allow yourself to entertain the fact that that's the dream that's meant for you, you allow yourself to stand close to that flame. You allow it to burn a little brighter. And then we get scared. What if it doesn't happen? And you convince yourself that your dream is scary. And your dream isn't scary at all. Your excuses and your fear of it and your joking is what's scary. And so how do you keep this dream alive? And this is a really important exercise, particularly for those of you who say, I don't know what I want, Mel. I don't know what my dream is. I have a very simple exercise that I've taught to hundreds of thousands of people. It's backed by science. And this is an exercise that is going to help you get back in touch with dreaming. See, I think part of the problem is that we've all gotten into this mode where we don't want to get our expectations up. So we put a lid on our own desires. We don't allow ourselves to want what we want. We don't allow ourselves to be in touch with the things that we really long for. And it's the fact that you won't even give yourself permission to dream. That's also making you feel unworthy. And so how are we going to tap back into this dream inside you? How are we going to get your desires flowing freely? How are we going to get you to start to believe that you're worthy of the things that you long for? I'll tell you how. It's very simple. Every single morning, you are going to make a cup of coffee or tea. And as part of your morning routine, you are simply going to write down five dreams a day. That's it. Five dreams a day you are going to make it a habit to claim what you want, if only by writing it on a piece of paper. And having taught this to hundreds of thousands of people, I already know what your questions are going to be. Are they the same things I write down? Are they big things? Are they little things? Are they things that can happen? What are they, Mel? Here's how you're going to do this. Do not overthink it. Sit down. You have a blank piece of paper. And just write down five things you want it could be, I want that new Gucci handbag. And you might not be able to pay for groceries right now. It might be, I want my puppy to stop pooping on the living room rug. It might be, I want to be the number one podcast host in the world. It might be, I want to do a stadium tour. I want to write a song that helps heal the world. I want to have a wonderful relationship with my mom, who I currently hate. Your dreams are yours. Do not judge them. Do not shrink them. This exercise is about clearing out the blockage and the gunk that has blocked the highway between your heart and your soul and what you will give yourself permission to want and desire in your life. Your self-doubt, your feeling that you're not worthy, your excuses, your people-pleasing, it's all blocking your access to this longing, to this dream within you. And so we got to just get the gears turning. We got to get these like kind of the, I don't even know what you call it, but this is a way to like grease the gears and get you free flowing. Why shouldn't you do a stadium tour? Why shouldn't you have that new Gucci handbag? If that's what you want, you can certainly do the work to get it. Why shouldn't you be happy or healthy or heal your cancer? These dreams are there for a reason. We got to get them out of your head where you bury them with excuses. And we got to get them into the world in real time where you can see them on a piece of paper. Now, 
Reason number one why you're going to do this, five dreams a day. They can be the same dreams. They can be different dreams. They can be big dreams. They can be little dreams. They can be thematic. They can be specific stuff. They can be anything you want. We just need to get your dreams and your desires flowing freely without you putting the lid on, invalidating, or arguing against them. So there's a second reason why this exercise is so effective. And it has to do with something called the Zygarnik effect. Now, the Zygarnik effect is a extraordinarily well-documented effect in your brain that was first discovered by a Lithuanian psychologist named Bluma Zygarnik. And she had her first study published about psychology and this theory in 1927. So this has been around for a long time. And what is the Zygarnik effect? Well, the Zygarnik effect is this. Inside of your brain, there is a mental checklist function. And whenever something is important to you, your brain is like, oh, ding, ding, ding. I guess she wants to do a stadium tour. Oh, ding, ding, ding. I guess she wants to get her cholesterol down. Whenever something's important to you, your brain takes notice. It opens up a mental checklist. And then your brain has this really interesting function where it will now work with you to help remind you of this thing that's important to do. It's like a little to-do list in your brain. And the Zygarnik effect is once your brain knows something is important and it's important if you keep writing it down, your brain is going to go to work trying to help you get it done. And the Zygarnik effect is so pronounced that it is used, everybody, in software design. Yep. You know how they talk about gamification? You know how you got to film out a form and then all of a sudden a little reminder pops up that like, you're 64% complete? Well, that's the Zygarnik effect. That's this mental checklist thing saying you're not done yet. You got a little bit more to go. And so this is so effective. And so, again, I'm going to summarize this and I'm also going to help you. If you go to melrobbins.com slash dream big, melrobbins.com slash dream big, I got a free download for you. Not only are we going to give you some of the key takeaways from this episode, but we're going to give you prompts so that you can print out this free sheet and use it every single morning to write down your five dreams, to tap into the Zygarnik effect inside your brain to help you keep those dreams alive and to help you start letting your desires and your worthiness flow freely through you. Okay, so we've covered a couple key topics so far. Your dreams are not a joke. They matter. You got to claim them. This exercise of writing down five things you want every single morning is going to tap into that super highway and it's going to help you build the neural pathways to give yourself permission to want things. It's going to help you tap into this flame inside you that is burning and that is begging for you to let it help you. I'm going to use this tool that I often use, which I call putting yourself in pause. My cat's about to come. I can hear him meowing, Mr. Noodle. Noodle. Come here, bud. You know, there's nothing like a cat coming into a space to bring you into the moment. Have you ever noticed that? So put yourself in pause. I just want you to do that with me right now. As you could tell, The emotions are totally overwhelming, not only because I'm exhausted and I've been sick, but also because I'm really disappointed. I'm not going to spend the weekend with my daughters. The cat is now on my lap. And uh, I'm going to put myself in pause, and I want you to do this with me right now. Just stop for a second, okay? Close your eyes unless you're driving a car. Put your hand on your heart and let's take a deep breath. Just be still for a moment. Take another deep breath. There's power in the pause. 
And look, the pause isn't going to change what's going on in your life right now. But every time you put yourself in pause, you become a little bit more equipped to handle it. I think you can hear that I'm starting to gain a little bit of steadiness in my voice. The deep breath helped me come back into my body instead of letting those emotions and the sadness and the fatigue overwhelm me. So today I want you to remember you can put yourself in pause whenever you need it. Just repeat that mindful moment that we shared together. And if someone that you know is sick like me or they're running on overdrive, which means they're about to become sick like me, or if they just need the reminder to slow down, to take a breath, to put themselves in pause for just a second and gather their strength so they can face whatever they're facing and carry on. Please share this message with them. Now, I'm going to be on the couch all day with my cat, Mr. Noodle. I'm going to be taking a big, long pause. And here's my promise. I'll be back to you very soon. And in the meantime, if you want more tools for making your life calmer, simpler, and happier, go listen to the episode, How to Let Go, Two Simple Ways to Find Clarity and Move On. And one more thing, in case no one else tells you, let me be the one to tell you that I love you, I believe in you and your ability to create a better life. And part of that means learning how to slow down, put yourself in pause, take a breath, and gather your strength. Actually, you know what? I'm going to commit right now to letting go of making myself wrong. Good job, Mel Robbins, for getting out there. Good job for trying out an episode where I would be walking and talking and recording it on my iPhone. And good job for having the presence of mind to realize it would be a better listening experience for you and a better experience for me to unpack this really important topic of letting go. How do you let go of what no longer serves you? I got to say, I get questions about this all the time. In fact, just yesterday, I got this question from Cheryl. Mel, how do you know that the thing you're holding on to is meant to be let go of versus fighting for it even harder? Do you have any thoughts or perhaps tools to help discover it or encourage the universe to bring that epiphany along? In other words, how do I know when it's time to let go? All right, everybody, get ready, because this is one of the most important aspects of creating a better life and of being a happier person. We spend so much time focusing on what we need to do, what we need to add in, what we need to change. And have you stopped to consider that the best place to make a change is by letting go of things, of projects, of thinking patterns, of relationships that no longer serve you? And the big question is how? How do you know when it's time? And I have got not only a fantastic visual metaphor to help you understand this concept, but I also have a really interesting way to approach this. We're going to talk about the fact that your energy and your intuition is always there to tell you when it's time to let something go because it no longer serves you. So to get into this topic, I want to introduce the metaphor. And it was the metaphor I had started talking about as we were on that hike together. I mean, here in the United States anyways, it is autumn. It is the fall season. We are all about pumpkins. We are in harvest time. There are corn stalks everywhere. We're getting ready for orange and red and all those amazing colors and carrot cake. I mean, I love this time of year. And I realize it may not be fall where you are. Uh, if you're you know, part of our global fan base halfway around the world, it's summertime. Don't get hung up on the fact that I'm using fall as a metaphor. 
I personally believe whenever it is that you are listening to this episode, even if it's two years from now, you're listening to this right now because you are meant to hear it right now, because there is a new season that needs to start in your life. And that's going to require you to let go of things that no longer serve you. And so let's talk about the metaphor of what happens to a tree when the fall season hits. And in researching this for you, because, you know, it's one thing to just kind of tell you a metaphor. It's another thing to really understand it and explain it. This was fascinating. I know we, we learned about chlorophyll and fall and the life cycle of a tree in elementary school, but I had forgotten most of this stuff. So check this out. The reason why a tree has leaves is because the tree needs energy to survive. It needs energy to grow. And the leaves have a very particular purpose. The leaves are there to take the sunlight and convert it to energy so that the tree can grow. And in exchange, the tree gives a ton of water back to these leaves. I mean, this process of the leaves sprouting and the leaves growing and the leaves taking its surface area and converting the sun into energy so the tree can go from a tiny little acorn to a mighty oak, that is a lot of energy. And there's this reciprocal nature to the relationship that a tree has to its leaves because the tree has to bring in tons of water in order to fuel this energy exchange. And here's the reason why leaves fall off a tree. In the middle of winter, at least here in the United States, when the ground is frozen and snowpack is on top, there is no water for the tree. And if those leaves with their big flat surface were to stay on that tree through winter, the leaves would kill the tree. It would suck the tree dry of all the water that it needs. An interesting thing about fall is that, you know, we look at the, the leaves turning and we look at the leaves dropping gently and falling down to the ground as this beautiful thing that happens, this natural thing that happens. It's so lovely. It's just wonderful. Isn't this delightful? Do you want to know that this is almost like a violent act, that the trees are pushing those leaves off its branches. The tree is basically going, yo, uh, if you are hanging around on my branches through the wintertime, you are going to suck me dry of all my energy. I am going to die if you don't get off my freaking branches. The tree literally pushes them, ejects them, kicks them out of their life. Why? Because there is no reciprocal energy exchange that can happen during the winter. The tree has to conserve its energy to survive. And after the winter season, once those leaves are gone and the tree can conserve its energy instead of giving it all to that leaf while killing itself. I bet you got areas of your life where you're giving all your energy into a relationship or into your work or into some stupid thinking pattern that you've been doing for years that makes you feel bad. You put all your energy in one direction. You get nothing in return. That's what fall is for a tree. The fall season for a tree is, thank you very much for spring and summer. You were amazing. This relationship between the leaf and the tree, this was reciprocal. You got energy from me. I got energy from you. Bada bing, bada boom. And then all of a sudden, boom. This is a one-way thing. And if I hold on to these leaves, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And I'm bringing that metaphor and that visual and that 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 documented point of view that this isn't just some lovely thing where the leaves you know change colors and it's so beautiful and now we all drink a pup, pumpkin spice latte that's not what this is this is a tree's survival this is about energy this is about the fact that in order to grow in order to be strong to be the best you you got to surround yourself with relationships and work and projects and friendships and habits where there is an equal reciprocal exchange that you give and you get and return. And that's where we're gonna start 
when it comes to how I want you to think about this concept of letting go. We're going to talk about how to identify that moment when there is no longer that energy exchange, that there is something that has become a complete energy suck. And when you realize whether it's a friendship or a romantic relationship or a job or some habit or a place that you live, when you realize that something has become an energy suck on you, that's when you know it's time to let go. That's when you know, like that tree, that you better kick that thing off your branches because it's hanging on to you or you're holding on to it. And if you keep doing that, what will happen? And you've had this happen in your life where you've held on to things for too long, where you refuse to let things go. And what did it do? It sucked you dry. It sucked you dry of your energy. It sucked you dry of your vitality. It made you feel depleted. Instead of those leaves or that project or that person withering away and, and falling to the ground so that you could regain your strength, so that you could step into a new season of your life, no, you gave it all to them. You held on for too long. Well, guess what? That's not happening anymore. Because what we're going to talk about when we come back from a short word from our sponsors, which I want you to listen to, because by the way, our sponsors, they're the reason why I can show up twice a week. There is a reciprocal exchange between us. They literally pay for this show, which is why I'm so enthusiastic about it. So we can put this out there around the world for free. So I want to give an energy exchange back to the amazing sponsors of the Mel Robbins podcast. Take a listen. We're going to be right back. Because we're going to now talk about, in detail, what do I mean by reciprocal energy exchange? And where are the major areas in your life where you tend to start to have this be a one-way thing, where you're given all the energy and you're the one that's depleted and dry? When you look at the research around happiness, researchers have put happiness into two big categories. One is hedonic happiness, and hedonic happiness is, am I having fun right now? It's the moment-to-moment -moment fluctuating experiences that you have. And let's go back to the metaphor. It's like the waves in the ocean. They come and they go. You can jump in, you can play, you can have fun, and then it's over. And then there is the deeper happiness, the eudaimonic happiness, which is the sense of your life having meaning of you feeling fulfilled and thriving in that life of yours. And it's important for you to understand that happiness has these two buckets because I think what happens for a lot of us, and this kind of gets to Andrea's question, is that maybe you have one type of happiness. Maybe you're having a lot of fun on the surface, but life doesn't feel very meaningful. Or maybe you're deep in it, but you're not having any fun. And so I really want to unpack the difference between these two things and why you need both before we jump into the three different ways that you can increase happiness in your life. And so let's go to another question from a listener named Rachel. Hey, Mel, I absolutely love your podcast and all of your work. I have a very loaded question and I know a one size fits all answer might not exist, but I wanted to ask anyway. Um, how can I truly be happy? How do I cultivate happiness? I read so many self-help books, read a lot about the effects of childhood trauma. I journal. I try to be conscious of my habitual thoughts and patterns and work to reframe them. I exercise. I'm always listening to inspiring and transformational content like you. I feel like I do all the things, but I still struggle just to be happy and to feel happy. And I feel very stuck in the same emotions and I really want to change. I really want to enjoy my life. Do you have any advice? Rachel, I so relate to you. And I want to just pass the mic to you listening right now. When Rachel said, I just want to enjoy my life, didn't you get the chills? Didn't you nod along and say, yeah, I just want to enjoy my life too. And this is really on my mind because I think that's the point of life, right? To really try to enjoy it. 
And one of the things that I notice can happen when you are in a period in your life where you're trying to heal, you're investing in yourself in your personal growth. You mentioned that you're working on trauma. You're trying to dig out of some of the holes maybe that you feel like you fell into. You're trying to change your mindset. That's serious work. That was me for years too. Here's the problem with having a big healing journey. You're not having any fun. I think about periods of my life when I was going through a lot of change and I was working on myself and I was doing everything that you're doing. Every book I picked up was self-help. Everything that I listened to was self-improvement. I couldn't even remember the last time I read a fiction novel or I went to a concert or I went to a party. Everything got so serious because my focus became so serious. And my focus was about improving my life, improving my life, improving my life. And doing the work to change your life, it's important. Doing the work to identify toxic patterns that you have or bad thinking patterns that make you feel like shit, that's super important. But you must also double down on the fun while you're doing the deeper work. And so the first thing that I want you to do is I want you to set an intention that your number one goal this year is to have more fun, to invest in that first category, hedonic happiness, that researchers say is so important. Because yes, it's meaningful. Yes, it's fulfilling to do the hard work to change your life for the better. But changing your life for the better also means that you need more moments of fun in your life. And I worry a lot about this based on what we've all experienced in the past three years. We've all become hermits. It's hard enough to get yourself out of your house. But the other thing that's happened is if you're not going into work, if you're still working from home, you're also missing out on all of the spontaneous stuff that happens when you bump into people when you're out and about. In fact, I can tell you a story. Just the other night, it was Sunday night. And, you know, as a bit of background, my husband and I had gotten some really awful news last week that a very, very close friend of ours suddenly died. Age 47, heart attack, gone. And I had been holed up in my house ever since hearing the news. I was super sad, feeling down, and I hadn't left the house in days. And so on Sunday, Chris says to me, Mel, I made a 4.30 reservation at the paddle tennis courts, which is a kind of form of almost like ping pong that you can play sort of like pickleball in the middle of the winter on these, on these tennis courts outside with some friends. It was the last thing I wanted to do. I wanted to just curl up on the couch and suck my thumb and feel sad. And we got into the car and the entire ride over, I was sitting there thinking, should I tell Chris I'm pissed? that he made this date with this couple to go play paddle. Should I tell him this is the last thing that I want to do? I kept saying to myself, should I say this? Should I not say it? And then I would say, no, don't, don't shit on his parade. Like, you know, just suck it up. It's going to be okay. We pull up. The sun's starting to go down. It's freezing. I've got a hat on and mittens on and I'm grumpy and I don't really want to be there. And then I see our friends and I felt a little lighter. Do you know it took about five seconds of hitting that ball around for me to feel totally different? The truth is I needed the fun. I needed the laughter. I needed to not be thinking about something so heavy. I needed to see people that I really like. I needed to do something that wasn't that serious, like working on myself or feeling sad or grieving. I needed fun. and. Getting out on that paddle court, it was fun. And there's a part of me that is sitting here going, Mel, are we really having a conversation right now on this podcast about the obvious? That we need to schedule time to have fun, that we need to force ourselves out of our houses, that we need to break this habit of being isolated and lonely? Yeah, we do have to have this conversation because I don't think you and I have truly grasped the extent to which our day-to-day -day lives and our happiness has been impacted by these past three years. I mean, even those of us who really enjoyed that period of lockdown where we were trapped inside with our families, um, 
this new normal, this part of it, where we're sort of back to normal, but we're not, but we're coping, but we're like this situation, the loneliness and isolation, it feels like it's become everybody's new lifestyle. It's our new default. But this isn't just obvious, it's well-researched. Researchers have proven that the difference between people who are happy and those of us who aren't is that happy people prioritize doing things that make them happy. <laughs> I know, it's so dumb, but I need the reminder too. So now let's go back to my analogy about the ocean and the beach and waves and happiness. And I want you to just imagine that you're sitting on the beach and those waves are rolling in and they're rolling out and there's a boogie board sitting next to you. At some point, you have to get off the towel and you got to run into that ocean and you got to go play. And the fact is, it just takes one person to get everybody else to go. There's always that one person in a group of people at a beach who stands up first and grabs the boogie board and says, let's go body surfing. Come on, guys, let's go into the waves. And thankfully, this past Sunday night, for me, it was Chris. He was that one person. And look, being intentional about enjoying your life, about having fun, particularly during those periods of time where you're grieving where you are going through something difficult, where life feels heavy, prioritizing fun is critical. But that's just one of the three things that you and I are gonna discuss when it comes to getting intentional and amplifying up the 40% of happiness that is within your control right now. And if you're sitting there scratching your head going, oh my God, this is so me, but Mel, like, I think I forgot how to have fun. Don't worry about it. I've got an entire episode that we did a while back called How to Have More Fun, and I will link to that along with all the studies that we're talking about in the show notes. And so now that you and I have been playing in the waves and you understand that dragging yourself out of the house to the beach, off the towel, into the ocean, and forcing yourself to do things that are fun, that that is part of happiness that we cannot escape. You and I are now going to go deeper into the ocean, and we're going to talk about the two other elements that you can tap into to create more happiness in your life right now. And we're going to do that using more questions from fellow listeners of the podcast when we come back. Welcome back. I'm Mel Robbins, and you and I are talking about what research says about creating more happiness in your life. We've already talked about the fact that researchers have identified two types of happiness, hedonic happiness and eudaimonic happiness, both of which are critical to your overall feelings of happiness. And we've talked about why getting intentional about having more fun is critical to you feeling happier now. Now we're going to jump into the deeper part of happiness, and that is the eudaimonic happiness, whether or not your life has meaning. Because when you go through periods of life where life is monotonous, it just feels kind of blah, you're on autopilot, you're not going to feel that happy. Just ask Jenna. Hey Mel, my name is Jenna and my question for you is, how do you truly find happiness in everyday ordinary life? I'm a mom of two boys and I struggle most days with being as joyful as I was when they were very mm. little. Mm. Uh, as a mother of three, Kids who are now young adults, uh, I can relate to what you were saying about how you were joyful when they were little. And I love that you use the word joyful because I want to go back to that metaphor that I introduced at the very beginning of an ocean and thinking about an ocean when you think about happiness. And so to me, when you go to the beach and it's a very, very calm day, there are no waves, there might not even be a cloud in the sky. Boy, it sure is beautiful. Happiness is like a still ocean on those days. It's your ability to stand in that ocean and feel this state of presence and connectedness and gratitude to simply being in the ocean. And I want to come back to something that you also said that I absolutely loved. You used the word ordinary. 
And the reason why I think it's important for us to focus in on the word ordinary is we often make the mistake of thinking that happiness is this big thing, this big burst, the big wave. And when it comes to the eudaimonic happiness, the deeper meaning in your life that creates the sense of happiness and fulfillment for you, I want to flip this perspective because true happiness comes from finding the extraordinary in the ordinary. That's right. True happiness is actually pretty ordinary. And researchers have identified the number one factor in you living a happy life. And it is the most ordinary thing on the planet, which is why most of us miss it. And that's the quality and depth of your relationships. So let's unpack this. The Harvard study of adult development is the longest in-depth longitudinal study of human life that's ever been done. I mean, this has been going on for 84 years and counting. And for those of you super geeks like me out there, this used to be called the Harvard Men Study. So when you hear people talking about the Harvard Study of Adult Development, that's the new name for this. And it now includes three generations of people that they've been studying. The original 724 participants now include 1,300 descendants. How cool is that? And here's the thing about this study. This study followed people through their life, asking them all kinds of questions as people aged. And one of the reasons why this study is so profound is because it tracked people as they lived. Most studies have people looking backwards, which means, you know, when you look backwards, you often change the details. That's why the Harvard study of adult development is so exciting and so accurate and the most accurate and important study of happiness that's ever been done. Not only because they have so much data and brain imaging scans, but they've also been studying people in real time, tracking them forward as they're living their lives. And Dr. Robert Waldinger is the fourth director of the study, and he and past study leaders have published these amazing findings that you and I can apply to our lives. These results from the Harvard Men's Study, they've been replicated in five other huge global studies. And I'm telling you all this because there's one singular conclusion from all of this data, all of this research, all of these fancy institutions, and it's this. Good relationships keep you happier and healthier. Good relationships make you happier and healthier. The single best decision you can make to improve your health and happiness is to cultivate what researchers call warm relationships. I know what you're thinking. Mel, what the hell are warm relationships? Well, from a clinical standpoint, warm relationships are relationships that don't cause conflict and you feel positive emotions around the people that you have a warm relationship with. Said in a normal person's way, it's basically people that make you feel warm and fuzzy. That's what warm relationships are. And I want you to stop and think right now. Let's apply the science. If you think about people in your life, I just want you to put two columns in your mind. Who would you put under the column labeled warm? They give you the warm and fuzzies. You get a text from them. You're like, oh, yeah, okay. You know, you're excited to see them. You feel energized when you make plans. Now there's the cold column. These are people that put you on edge. These are people that drain your energy. These are the people that when they call or text you, you're like bracing for something. I can boil 84 years of research down to one takeaway. You want to be happier? Put all your energy into warm relationships, building them, strengthening them, spending time with those people in the warm column. You do that, you will be a happier you right now. And the second way that you can do that, by the way, prioritizing the warm is spend less time with people in the cold column. You either need to stop hanging out with them because they're sucking your energy dry, or you got to put some effort into warming them up by forgiving them or reframing how you see them or working on your boundaries so that you're not triggered by them and their negativity doesn't impact your happiness. 
So keep that visual of a warm and a cold column. And as you meet people in your life, you can immediately feel what they're like. Are they warm? Are they bringing out the fuzzies? Or are you feeling on edge? Because when it comes to happiness, your happiness right now, not the I'll be when happy, the happiness that truly matters, standing in that deep end of the ocean, the quality of your relationships is truly the most important thing that matters. And I can explain why at an even deeper level. The reason why this matters so much, it is the number one indicator of a happy life, good, warm relationships, floating in that ocean with your warm buddies, keeping you buoyant. The reason why is evolution. See, positive or warm interactions with people, you know what that does, that warm, fuzzy feeling, those kind of people in your warm column? They make you feel safe. When you're around those people, you're not on edge, so your body feels safe. And the opposite is true when you're around people that you would put in the cold column, because when you're around negativity, when people trigger you and they put you on edge, when you feel like you can't be yourself, you're now in a stress response of fight, flight, or freeze. And this response to other people, it's wired in you. Early homo sapiens survive because their bodies and their brains, they not only encouraged connection, but they also signaled when somebody might be unsafe. You and I survived because we're social beings. So this is hardwired into us. And here's where it gets interesting. When you feel loneliness, your brain perceives that as life-threatening. And loneliness is not just about physical separation from other people. You can feel very lonely in a crowded room. You can feel lonely in a bad marriage. You can feel lonely in a toxic friendship. And if you're nodding your head right now thinking, wow, maybe it's not unhappiness. Maybe the core issue for me is I'm lonely. Well, 75% of adults feel moderate to high levels of loneliness. And loneliness is about the quality of your relationships. And I want to tie this back to evolution. Loneliness feels threatening because you're meant to survive in a tribe of people. You're meant to be connected with people that make you feel safe and warm. It's not only part of happiness. This goes down to your mind and body needing protection. And they've even proven that when life is really hard, when it can come at you in full-on attack mode, when you're in survival mode, warm, connected relationships protect you from the stress of life. So how do you do this? How do you tap into relationships? It sounds simple, but again, make the column, warm and cold, and then call your friends, text them, arrange time to meet them. So when you feel a pang of loneliness, I want you to understand it's an alarm, just like anxiety. It's a signal that you're missing connection. Please do not ignore it. You may be surprised to hear that I felt this way for a very long time. I kept saying out loud, I'm not happy. I don't feel fulfilled. But when I dug deep into what was really going on for me, the core issue was loneliness. I was having fun. I was really busy. I was doing meaningful work. But deep down inside, I was really lonely. And it may also surprise you to hear that it was during one of the most successful stretches in my career. I was on the road all the time. I was booked nonstop to give speeches. I was working on all kinds of projects with Audible. The business was booming. I was making lots of money. And I have never been unhappier because I was lonely. I was traveling so much, chasing success, chasing achievement, going for the next thing, staying busy that I never saw my friends. I barely saw Chris. I missed out on a ton of time with our daughters while they were in high school. It was just go, go, go. Now, I had a lot of fun on the business trips. I would laugh a lot. 
I was always traveling with colleagues, so I wasn't alone. And I was having fun in the waves of life. But when you talk about floating in the deep end of the ocean, I was profoundly lonely. And that meant I was profoundly unhappy. And it can be powerful when you admit this to yourself, because when you realize what you're dealing with is loneliness, that helps you identify the issue you need to improve, which is you need to start reaching out to people. You know, we underestimate the impact that simply getting an unexpected text from an old friend can have on you. I mean, think about how amazing it is when you have a birthday and everybody on social media that gets, you know, the kind of notification that it's your birthday, they come out of nowhere and they wish you happy birthday. It's like, that's unbelievable. It feels so good. You haven't talked to that person since high school, but it feels good to have somebody just give you a quick comment on your birthday. And so if you're sitting around saying, I'm really lonely, but you're not reaching out, you're not calling people, you're not the one making plans or inviting people over for dinner, guess what? You're going to stay lonely. Because when I really looked in the mirror and said, I'm lonely, I need to do something about this. I, I never get invited anywhere. I don't see anybody. Well, I wasn't inviting anybody over. I wasn't making any plans. It starts with you. And look, it could be anybody. It could be friends, family, coworkers. All you need to do is identify old relationships or cold relationships or warm relationships where you haven't seen somebody in a long time and reach out. And by the way, it could be old relationships. It could be people you haven't seen in a long time. Just anybody at all that makes you feel warm, start putting energy into talking, texting, commenting, and making plans to see them. And be careful of the cold people because research shows that spending time with the people in the cold column, it can actually make you feel more lonely. And it even worsens your health to be around people like that. And so you've got your friend Mel Robbins' permission to stop putting energy into draining relationships because that's only going to make you feel more lonely and spend more time with warm relationships. And that brings me back to Jenna's question because she mentioned, did you notice that she felt happier when her kids were little? I suspect that when your kids were little, you were probably part of mom groups. You saw young moms all the time at drop-off, at pickup, at play group, and you felt like you were part of something. You were part, uh, you had more warm relationships in your life. That's a sign that you're just missing connection. And I know I said it already, but I can't highlight enough how profound of a difference it can make to simply admit to yourself that you're lonely. That was the turning point for me when I realized a couple of years ago, holy cow, I'm unhappy because I'm profoundly lonely. I don't see Chris enough, so I'm lonely in my marriage. I am lonely in my family because I'm not around. I'm working all the time. I never see my friends. And so once I said it was loneliness, that was the cause of my unhappiness. I could do something about it. And you want to know the first decision I made? I made a decision that I was going to change my work life, that I was going to get off the road, that Oakley being in high school was like a melting ice cube. And once the time was gone, I was not going to get it back. And so I reorganized my entire career, my entire business. Instead of sitting on a plane, I'm now sitting above my garage talking to you in a microphone so that I can be home. And it took a lot of work, but I'll tell you what, realizing that traveling that much for work was making it hard to cultivate those warm relationships, that was a huge wake-up call. Because on the surface, it looked like I was having a great time. I was in the waves. But I sure as hell wasn't when it came to the deeper stuff. And I know what you're thinking. Well, Mel, at least you have friends to go back to. What if I don't have any friends or many friends? Well, 
I would say this, here's where you can start. Part of warm relationships and happiness is also cultivated by social interactions, the tiny ones you have every single day. Just talk to strangers. This is a great thing to do, by the way. And there's a study that was done by the University of Chicago that you have no clue how happy a random social interaction with a stranger can make you. You kind of inflate in your mind that it's going to be messy to talk to other people, but you underestimate the actual benefits of talking to other people. People who talk to strangers on a train or on a plane or at a bus stop or just at a coffee shop, they're much happier after they talk to the stranger, even if they don't think beforehand that they will be. You know who's great at this? My mother. I was just visiting my mom down in Florida. And when I was little, I used to think it was so annoying, but I now admire this about her. Absolutely everywhere we go, my mom talks to everybody. She talks to everybody about everything. She's constantly commenting on, oh, I like that sweatshirt, or hey, how you doing, or nice day. And people stop, and they talk. And next thing you know, they've made a connection, or they're talking about a restaurant recommendation, or some, it's just amazing. And the energy is immediately boosted. And if you're not good at this, here's a great tip. Always compliment somebody's nails. If somebody is waiting on you or standing in front of you in line or you're sitting next to them, just compliment their nails. If you see somebody reading, ask them what they're reading and if they like it. That's a simple way to compliment somebody, to open up the dialogue, and it always boosts the energy. And one of the things that I'm really concerned about, and I've talked a lot about this on the podcast, and I know the researchers at Harvard are concerned about this too, and that's remote work. Everybody being at home. When we're at home, we miss out on these tiny social interactions with coworkers, with the barista, with the lady at the checkout counter, counter, with the guy that you always see at the grocery store, with the customers that you're used to seeing come into the store. These tiny social interactions go a long way to making you feel warm. So bottom line, relationships, relationships, relationships. Talk to that stranger in line, push yourself to reach out to people, text somebody every single day, and don't forget your family. You kind of put family on the back burner, don't you? Because you think they're always going to be there. Make an effort. There's a lot of people in your family, maybe even cousins you haven't seen in a while, that you have a warm relationship with. I'm prioritizing happiness, which means I'm prioritizing the relationships in my life. But you got to push yourself, okay? Let's make ourselves a promise that we're both going to do this because you got the research and you now know why it matters. We are going to talk about the three things that you need to accept about other people. These are things I need to accept too. These are not easy things to accept, but trust me, when you accept these truths, the three truths about other people, it's going to make your life easier. And I'm excited to talk to you about this topic because it's very clear Based on the number of questions that you have submitted at melrobbins.com about other people, Mel, how do I get my spouse to change? Mel, how do I get my kid to change? Mel, how do I inspire my team? Mel, what do I do about this person over there and that person over here? Or there's a different version of this question you've been asking too, which is, as I'm changing, why are my family not that supportive? Why is it that as I make big changes in my life, like I I'm not getting the support that I deserve? Why is uh, the people around me not joining in on all these positive changes uh, I'm making that are inspired by this Mel Robbins podcast thing? Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to handle that today because it's clear that you need more advice, you need more inspiration, and you need more Mel Robbins on this topic about how to deal with other people. And there's something else. I need more of something. I need more of you. And so what you're going to hear today is you're going to hear listeners of the Mel Robbins podcast asking questions on this topic. And we are going to jump in and unpack these three truths that you got to accept, I got to accept about other people. Now, before I tell you the three truths, I just want to say one other thing. I have been absolutely floored by your response to this show. And I want to thank you. I want to thank you for spending your time with me. And I also want to thank you 
for sharing this with the people in your life. I was in California uh, the other day and I was ordering a sandwich at a deli. And this woman who made my sandwich, as she handed me over, you know, the little sandwich wrapped in the white after they put the little sticker on it, she leans forward and she says, I didn't want to say anything, but I've been listening to your podcast. My sister shared an episode with me, and I just want to tell you something. I immigrated here as a little girl from Africa, and I feel like what I'm learning on this podcast she was whispering. I don't know if she didn't want her colleagues to hear or her boss. Like, I didn't know why she was whispering, but she's whispering. And she had these big glasses on just like me. And she said, but I feel like what I'm learning on this podcast, it's helping me sprout wings so I can fly and reach heights that I've always dreamt of. And I want to tell you, that is a shared success. You are helping me do that. Together, we are creating a positive ripple effect around the world. Together, we are inspiring people to dream bigger, to face obstacles and challenges, and most importantly, to feel a little less alone. And so I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for sharing these episodes with your friends, with your family. I want to thank you for posting it on social media because you just never know how sharing this stuff is going to change somebody's life. And I'm telling you right now, you are part of a force for good in this world that is empowering other people. And that's why I want you to know the three things that you have to accept about other people. Okay. And let me tell them to you right now. And then as we go through the questions, I am going to unpack these at a deeper level and, and explain to you that these truths, they're there no matter what issue you are dealing with when it comes to other people. So truth number one, if they wanted to, they would. Truth number two, you can't make somebody else change. You can make them dinner, you can make them laugh, but you cannot make someone else change. And number three, stop being mad that people aren't who you want them to be. Those are the three truths. They are hard to accept but when you do, they make your life easier. And as we go through these questions one by one, and I not only give you more inspiration, more advice, more research about the specific issues in each question, I'm going to come back to these three truths over and over and over again and show you how accepting these three truths and applying them to all your relationships, it actually makes your life easier. And it's also easier on other people because what you're going to find out is because they apply not only to other people, but they also apply to you and me. So let's just take rule number one. If they wanted to, they would. Now, that kind of stings when you think about other people, when you think about folks in your life that, boy, I wish they'd make an effort. I wish they'd show up. I wish they'd reach out. I wish they'd try a little bit harder. I wish they'd get healthier. I wish they'd... Yeah. If they wanted to, they would. But guess what? It also applies to you. There are people in your life that wish you would make an effort, that wish you would change some aspect about you. And the truth about all of us is we do the things we feel like doing. And when it matters to you, you do it. And it is hard to accept the fact that if you want to know where somebody stands on an issue, watch their actions. That tells you exactly what they want to do and what they don't want to do. Do not listen to their words because it's easy to say, yes, no, I do this, I'll do that to talk the talk, but talk is cheap. And so it is hard to accept that if they wanted to, they would. And the truth about you is if you wanted to, you would. And so I wanted to kind of like say this swings both ways. Everything that we're going to talk about is true about other people. And it's also true about you. And I like reminding both of us that because it gives you a level of humility and a little bit more compassion when you get into situations with people where they're not doing what you want them to do. That brings me to our first question from Lisa. Hi, Mel. My name is Lisa, and I have a question for you. Mel, I am currently struggling with being a more tolerant person. I struggle with accepting others and their bullshit. We all have bullshit, and we all have to carry it, deal with it, and unload it. Don't get me wrong. 
I have worked on myself for years trying to be better and do better. But damn, I want to scream sometimes. Just be better. I have had to deal with so much in life, but I've always wanted more for myself and my family, regardless of the shit that life serves up. Meeting people where they are in life is so important. I know and understand this, but my patience is tried when people wallow. Any advice, Mel? Okay, I love this question. And I'm sure you can relate to it as much as I can relate to it. And before I dig into this, I want to divide Lisa's questions into two different topics, okay? So the first topic is her frustration that people don't want to do better. That's topic number one. Topic number two is how to deal with what's really irritating, which is people who wallow was her word. I say marinate commiserate, just absolutely at some level, love their bullshit. You know, those people, something's always wrong. They're always complaining. The weather's always bad or they're always unhealthy. They're like, like, you know, that kind of person. So let's start with the first part of that, which is this frustration that you hear in Lisa's voice. I just want them to do better. I've done better. There's almost like an arrogance and a judgment in that, right? That, oh, well, if I fix myself, you should fix yourself. If I can do this, then you should do this. And to me, that's toxic positivity. Just assuming that because you've done it, that somebody else should. And I'm emphasizing the word should, because should holds judgment. If you have the perspective that, if I've done it, then you could do it too. That's inspiration. That's helping somebody. And so what you want to make sure that you're doing is that if you're frustrated, that you're coming from a place of love and coming from a place of wanting to help somebody rather than coming from a place of judgment of the should of the, you know, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, because we've all been on the receiving end of that, right? Where somebody's beaten you down because they've done something and they think you should do something. I can give you a really good example of this, because I think there's a big difference of somebody being capable of doing something and somebody not being capable yet. As as a person that is new to personal development, and I'm talking about myself, I've only known about personal development for just over 10 years. I am new to therapy. I mean, I've been engaged in therapy for a long time, but I feel like it takes a while to understand that there are certain things that a lot of people have never even thought about or been taught. I mean, I didn't bump into a lot of the topics that I'm talking about right now until I was in my mid 40s. For example, I'll give you one. I didn't truly understand trauma. When I heard the word trauma, I thought that that was something that that people that that served in the military had. I thought that you had to be on a tour of duty and see absolutely something horrific or be somewhere where there's extreme violence or be the victim of a really violent crime. I did not realize that there's big T trauma and there's little t trauma. I didn't realize that growing up in a household where you experience emotional abuse or you have parents that are distant or mismatched, or maybe you experienced a childhood where there was a lot of poverty or there was discrimination. These are all forms of trauma. I had no idea. And so there are people in your life that would love to change, but they can't right now because they don't even understand that they are trapped in some kind of a trauma pattern. They're not aware of it. There are people in your life that would love to have the level of fitness that you have. I'd love to have the level of discipline that you have, but they're not capable of it right now because they maybe are struggling with depression or maybe they don't have the family structure around them that is supportive that you have, or maybe they didn't have the experiences that you've had in your life that have allowed you to develop the habits that you've had. And so I think it's really important when you start to feel yourself frustrated with other people to check your ego 
and to ask yourself, well, am I in the lane of wanting someone to better themselves because I care about them and I see potential in them? Or am I in the other side of this, which is I'm being really judgy. That's where my frustration is coming from. And I'm assuming that somebody's got the resources and the ability and the support and the knowledge and all of the, uh, I don't know, like motivation that you need in order to get started. And so I think it's super important, step one, that when you feel that frustration, when you feel yourself getting hooked, that you check yourself at the door. Do I want them to do this because I care about them or am I judging them and I think that they should do this because I think that what they're, bop, 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 when you get into that lane and you know it, you've got to take a breath. You got to recognize that you're coming from superiority and I want you to step to the other side because understanding is an act of love. Being compassionate is an act of love. Being tolerant of where somebody is, is an act of love. I'm going to give you an example from my own life. So just this morning, Chris yelled at me. <laughs> That's my husband. And I'm kind of embarrassed to admit what happened to you. Because boy, oh boy, um, I will tell you, if Chris heard Lisa's question, he would say, I'm struggling with being more tolerant of my wife, Mel. And so here's what happened. Our new puppy, Homie, is going to go to a puppy class. And in order to go to this puppy training class on Wednesday, he needs to be up to date on his vaccines, right? No problem. Because when we got our puppy, when he was nine weeks old, I took him to the vet. He got all of his shots at week 12. And that was great. I'm a responsible pet owner. This is fantastic. Then all of a sudden the podcast launched and I've been gone. So Chris looks at me this morning and says, why didn't you tell me that homie is not up to date with his vaccines? I'm like, what are you talking about? I took him when we first got him. He said, Mel, that was when he was 12 weeks old. He's almost 20 weeks old, Mel. He's missed two veterinarian appointments. He is eight weeks late on getting his vaccinations. <laughs> I, I'm laughing because I feel so bad. And I said, well, I, I, and he, he, he's like, didn't you make follow-up appointments? I said, yes, yes. Where's his folder, you know, that, that, that came with him when we got him as a puppy. I, I, I borrowed a Sharpie from the vet when I was checking out and I wrote the dates in there. And sure enough, we got the folder out and there were the two dates. We have missed both of those appointments. I never put them in the calendar. Chris took the folder. And this is a man who never gets upset. He took that folder, you guys. He slammed it shut. He slammed it against his desk. He stood up. He didn't even wheel around on his chair. He stood up, the chair rolled away, and he said, Mel, don't give me this ADHD shit. I know you have a lot going on, but you have a living and breathing animal that you are supposed to be taking care of. This is not acceptable. You have to do better. And there's the dog barking on cue. Apparently he agrees. <laughs> can't make this up. Everybody hates me right now. Yeah. And you know, and here's the thing, like I'm, I know that Chris wanted to scream. Chris did scream at me, just be better. And I know that I'm now going to get flooded with comments and emails about this. I'm okay with that. I know I'm going to get a lot of advice about ADHD. I know I'm going to get advice about supplements. Now that you're hearing this story, I'm going to get a lot of you that think I'm a terrible pet owner. I'm cool with that. This is what actually happened this morning. And here's what I had to say to Chris, I want to do better. I don't think I can right now. I am so busy at work. I do not have an assistant. I am terrible with the calendars. I'm actually impressed that I wrote the dates down that they gave to me. I thought I put them in the calendar, Chris. 
but my brain is dropping balls left and right. And so the reason why I'm telling you this story is I'm not letting myself off the hook. I am motivated to try to figure out how to improve the systems that I have and improve the level of support that I have because I don't want to be dropping these balls. Chris doesn't need to get frustrated at me for me to feel like shit about this. Of course I want to do better. But this is one of those instances where my brain doesn't work like his. I can't just, like Chris is Mr. Foundational Operations Guy. Chris methodically sits and organizes and can sit still. He's really good with tech and with Excel spreadsheets. I am the opposite. I am absolutely the opposite. And so the reason why I'm telling you this story is because I guarantee you, you have somebody in your life that, my gosh, you just want to bang your head against the wall. And you can tell yourself if they wanted to, they would. And that's true for some things. It is true. It's true for whether or not people want to show up at an event. It's true for whether or not people reach out to you. It's true for whether or not people make an effort. It's true for whether or not people are engaging in healthy habits. If they wanted to, they would. And then there are some times that it's really important in your life in order to manage your own frustration to be a little bit more empathetic that if they could, they would. And I'll tell you, I am motivated to get the support that I need so that I do not drop balls like this because I want to do better. And having Chris yell at me, it was actually kind of helpful this morning because it, it just allowed him to be frustrated. It allowed me to see that this really is a big deal because he keeps picking up the slack on my behalf. And that's not a great solution either. And so here's kind of where the takeaway is on that. At the end of the day, it's about managing your energy. And when you allow somebody else's consistent behavior, I'm not talking about stuff where people are breaking the laws or they're addicted to something or, you know, something that's super, super destructive. But I've been married to Chris for 26 years and I've been this forgetful. I've been this forgetful and this bad the entire time we have been together. This is not new Mel Robbins. I am definitely overwhelmed with the launch of this podcast and the move to Vermont and all the travel recently and not having an assistant right now. But this is standard. I have wanted to change this my whole life. And I'm trying, man. And a little bit of empathy and support goes a long way. Because if you don't give that to the people in your life, if you're not more tolerant of the things that they're not capable of, they're just going to feel demoralized and ashamed. And so, yes, if they wanted to, they would. And make sure that if it's a situation where they can't really, or it's really hard for them, that you bring a little bit more empathy because that's going to help them. The other thing is, let's go to number two. You can't make someone else change. So I think this is super important because if you get as frustrated as Lisa's getting, ah, you can feel like Chris is, ah, you can't make someone change. You just can't do it. Yes, you can make them dinner. You can make somebody laugh. You can make requests. You cannot make someone change. And so I'm going to tackle this in two ways. Do you know that Chris and I have come back to this issue of Mel's forgetfulness over and over and over and over again? And I'd say about 15 years ago, we made a decision because I am terrible with logistics and I am notorious at dropping balls and I am the queen of good intention. I am the queen of good intentions and I often lack the follow through. And I'm talking simple stuff. Like literally, here's another example. Um, we are going to a holiday party. I think it's on the 17th of the month. And uh, a friend of mine texted me and said, are you guys going to this party? I said, yes. She said, great. We're going to have people over for cocktails first. I said, great. Given that Chris and I had just fought about the dropping of the ball of the veterinarian appointment, I immediately screenshotted her text and sent it to my husband, Chris, and said, honey, I don't want to forget to write this in the calendar. So I'm telling you, so that you can make sure that we know and remember to go to this. That is what our system has been forever. So 
What's interesting is that you've got two choices when it comes to somebody and their behavior. Rule, the rule you need to remember is you can't make them change, which means you either have to stop trying to make them change, or you need to figure out how to show up differently to make up for what they're doing wrong or to support them in an entirely new way. And so we already had a solution for the fact that this is an issue that I cannot change. And the solution is Chris is the point person for all things. If you want us to show up, go to Chris. If you need a check written, go to Chris. If you need to make sure that it's in the calendar, go to Chris. If the kids need a, uh, a whatever it's called, like a, you know how kids always have that, that exam that they need before they go to sports? What's that called? Like the, the annual wellness check? Thank you. You know how kids need an annual wellness check? Guess when Mel Robbins realizes they do? The day it's due. That's right. So if you do not want to have that kind of emergency, go to Chris. But what you have to accept in your life is that you're not going to make someone else change. I'm super motivated to be better, but Chris can't make me do it. I have to be the one to do it. And so you know what you're doing when you put energy into being frustrated about other people who either won't or can't make that change you want them to make? You're just burning energy. Imagine if you took all that energy that you're frustrated at other people and you just poured that energy in a positive direction to make your own life better. I often think about how many years of my life I have wasted being frustrated with other people. Truly, wishing they would change, wanting them to change, trying to make them change. I've tried manipulating people. I've tried bribing people. I've tried, like, I'm talking with like a box of Legos or something. I've tried motivating people. I've tried inspiring people. The fact of the matter is you can do all those things, but if somebody doesn't want to, they won't. If somebody can't, then they won't. So yes, make them dinner. Yes, make them laugh. Yes, try to be compassionate and understanding. But all of that energy and frustration that you can hear in Lisa, oh, I want to scream sometimes. I'm sure you do because you're trying to make them change. That's why you're frustrated. And that brings me to the third rule. You got to stop being mad at people for not being who you want them to be. I will never be a accountant. I will never be somebody who is OCD detail oriented. That's not me. My genius is in being creative. It's in connecting with people. It's, you know, flying by the seat of my pants. That's my genius. And somehow Chris and I have made it work for 26 years. And I think it has to do with the fact that we are 99% compassionate, understanding, and supportive of one another. And then there's those 1% moments that happen today over me being a dumbass about the new puppy. And of course, I feel terrible about it, but I will never be Susie Q with the calendar. That's just not who I'm supposed to be in life. And that's okay. But I can be more responsible about getting the support I need so I don't leave other people in breakdown. And we are going to get into boundaries because I know you're already going to, well, what do you do, Melvin? We will get there. But I want to address one other aspect of Lisa's question, and it's this. Meeting people where they are in life is so important. I know and understand this, but my patience is tried when people wallow. Any advice, Mel? I'm going to give you a specific tactic for people who wallow. I call this the six-month rule. The people in your life get six months to wallow in anything. They have six months to wallow about the divorce. They have six months to wallow about the weight they've put on. They have six months to wallow about the job they lost or the circumstances or the weather or whatever else. And once the wallowing, passes the six month mark, you have a boundary to draw. Okay. And this boundary works like a freaking charm because number one, if they don't want to, they're not going to change. You're just going to wallow. Number two, you can't make them change. So don't even try. And number three, you got to stop being mad about this person not being a person that you want them to be, but you can draw a boundary and you want to hear the boundary. It's the six month rule. Here's what you say. So, and so I'll give you an example from my own life. So I have a um, friend 
that got a divorce after a really like horrible, it was like, you know, one of those divorces is just ugly, just ugly, ugly, ugly. <clears throat> and the divorce was finalized. Okay. This friend of mine, every time I saw her constantly complaining about the ex and the, this and the, that, and the other thing and the other thing and the other thing. And finally, after six months, I looked at her and I said, you are no longer allowed to talk about this in front of me. I have recommended therapists. I have been a good friend. I have given you books to read, all of which you have done nothing about. I am no longer available to be a soundboard for your wallowing because it is clear to me that you don't want to do anything about this. The second that you would like to change this, I am here to support you. I am here to help you, but I am not available for you to stay stuck. I care about you too much. So if you'd like to go complain to somebody else, please do. But you are not allowed to bring this person's name up. You are not allowed to talk about your marriage, your ex-marriage, your ex, any of it. I'm not available for that anymore. And an interesting thing will happen. That person will be mortified. And they probably won't call you for a while because they're still addicted to their wallowing. You're not trying to change them. Isn't that interesting? You're not trying to change them. You didn't say stop wallowing. You said, I'm not available for it. So you know who changed in that relationship? You did. You changed what you're available for. Now, Chris could literally say to me, you're not allowed to take the animals to the vet unless I'm with you. You're not allowed to make travel plans. You're not allowed to respond to invites. He could say that to me and draw a boundary. He's not asking me to change. He's basically changing how he shows up with me, which is basically what he did about 15 years ago. And it solved most of the issues. So I want you to understand that when you understand and you accept these three truths about people, if they wanted to, they would, you know, unless they can't. Number two, you can't change anybody. And number three, stop being mad at people for not being who you want them to be. You take all the power back. None of this says you can't change. And so when you get frustrated by somebody else complaining, cut off access to the complaining. You're not saying I don't love you. You're actually saying the opposite. You're saying I love you so much that I'm not going to be a part of you staying stuck. And as long as I listen to this garbage come out of your mouth, you are going to be stuck. I'm not here for it. I'm here for your transformation. I am here for you creating a better life. I'm here for you moving on. I'm here for you no longer giving airtime to this asshole that you're divorced to. I am here for your future. I am no longer here for your past. When your friend is ready to change, guess what? They will because they will want to. Remember, that's rule number one. If they wanted to, they would. And, you know, one of the things that I want to say before we move on to question number two is that I think a lot of us learn that part of a relationship is struggle, that there's conflict, that there's tension, that you've got to have somebody to fight against or push against, that you saw these patterns growing up or they have been patterns in friendships or relationships. And so you're just kind of used to this push-pull. Well, what if I told you that it doesn't have to be that way? That maybe if you're in relationships that feel like a lot of work, that that's a sign that the relationships that you're in are no longer working for you. And one of the fastest ways to get rid of the struggle is drop the rope. Now, what does that mean? So think about tug of war. When you are playing a game of tug of war where you're on one side of the rope and, you know, you got other people on the other side of the rope and you're pulling back and forth and it's a lot of effort and pulling, yanking, yanking. You want to know the best way to win tug of war? Literally, as somebody goes to yank backwards, let go of the rope, they fall on their ass and then you yank the rope back towards you. Who said that's not fair? Of course that's fair. Letting go of the struggle often makes the struggle go away. And so notice that... Lisa's question was, Mel, I'm struggling to be a more tolerant person. And so the way you become more tolerant is accept those three things about people. If they wanted to, they would. If they could, they would. Number two, you can't make them change. Number three, stop being mad at them for not being who you want. And then you've learned some other things. Doesn't mean you can't change. 
Doesn't mean you can't draw boundaries. Doesn't mean you can't say you can do all this stuff you want, but don't do it in front of me. I, I have another example of that. I have a friend who is dating somebody and she adores him, absolutely adores him, and then confessed to me, but you know, when he goes out with his guy friends, they gamble and he does coke and I'm not down with it. I'm like, don't tell me, tell him. You're not going to change him, but you can tell him, I got a boundary. Don't you do that around me. That'll make somebody think because you're following the three rules You're not trying to change them, but you're very clear about what your values are and what's good for you. Not asking. You didn't say don't do that. You said don't do it around me. Big difference. That makes somebody stop and think, doesn't it? It's going to make somebody question, well, what am I doing? If this person I really care about doesn't want it done around me, maybe I should start thinking about what I want done around me. I like it because it's sneakier and it's the truth. And it works with these three rules. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe.